Welcome again to these continuing studies on the building blocks of salvation. And uh, we're talking about the subject of election or choosing and some of the key questions that people ask on this subject. And David's been doing some research and uh, he has, I think, some good questions for us. So David, why don't you go ahead with uh, your first one? Uh, yes, the first one uh, looks at two verses that seem to say that there are people that are elect to salvation. What comments do you have on these? The first verse being 2 Timothy 2 verse 10. All right, let me read uh, the three verses from verse 8 through 10. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now once again, when we look at a passage like this, we have to ask, what election is he referring to? There are elect angels, and Israel is elect, and the church is elect, and so on. And so we need to be careful that we understand who's being referred to here. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Jews in uh, Romans 9 uh, through 11, and he says there in chapter 10 and verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And also in chapter 11, verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the fathers or the patriarch's sake. And so the idea here is that um, Paul longs to see those who have been elected, that is chosen for the purpose of spreading God's blessing to the whole world, but who have been set aside by their unbelief, he still longs to see these people saved. And so I think it's important for us to understand uh, this idea that God's election uh, having to do with Israel, although they have been set aside temporarily as a nation, he has not given up on his plan eventually to reach the nation of Israel and so says Paul, all Israel shall be saved. What a great reminder of how God has elected different groups of people for different purposes, uh, mm -hmm. looking at that verse. Uh, the second verse uh, that seems to say that people are elect to salvation is 2 Thessalonians 2.13. So what comments do you have uh, from this verse? Okay, well let me read the verse, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And in our earlier studies, we talked about the importance of understanding that salvation can be in the past, the present, or the future. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved from the influence or power of sin. And I will be saved someday from the very presence of sin. And so it's important for us to understand the theme of 2 Thessalonians. These believers who were somewhat untaught in the matters of the future events, they thought that they had missed out somehow on the rapture and that they were going through the tribulation. And Paul explains this at the beginning of chapter two. Now brethren concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, uh, don't be soon shaken, he says, in mind, or troubled uh, by spirit or by word or by letter as if uh, from us as though the day of Christ had come. And so he explains that uh, this great man of sin is going to come and those who uh, do not have a love for the truth are going to come under the judgment of God, the wrath of God. Uh, however, uh, we're thankful, he says, that God from the beginning chose you to be saved. 
That is, to be taken out of the world before the wrath of God falls. And so in the context, uh, I believe that's the clear meaning of the passage. And, and there's a resource at Uplook.org concerning this verse, is that right? Exactly, yes. I, I wrote a, a little blog article on this very verse because it does concern people. One passage of scripture that is often considered with the topic of election is Romans chapter 9. Now, if this passage is not referring to God choosing some for salvation, why would Paul then anticipate that some would think God is unrighteous in verse 14? Now, anyone who's done a serious reading of the book of Romans knows what the theme of Romans is. It's the righteousness of God and how we can acquire that righteousness. And of course, there are various options suggested, one of them working uh, to do it, one uh, to gain credibility through my link with Israel, uh, one by keeping the law, and so on. And Paul shows that each of these is invalid for very clear reasons and that the only way we can receive the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ. And so it's a gift of grace. Um, so when we come to the end of chapter 8, we have this crescendo of praise where he declares there's nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, which sounds terrific. But imagine the Roman believer sitting there and beginning to think now, wait a minute, uh, what about the Jews? Weren't they loved by God? Uh, weren't they secure? Didn't he say through Jeremiah, I've loved you with an everlasting love? What's happened? And if they could lose their position of favor and love, maybe we could too. And that's why Paul segues into this discussion. And you'll notice it's no dry theological issue with him. Uh, he, he is passionate about this and actually says he could wish himself accursed from Christ in order to see the Jewish people saved. Now, as we follow down through the argument, he, he begins in verse 4 to explain all of the singular blessings that came to the nation of Israel. And um, he speaks about uh, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, and so on. And it concludes with whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. So right away we see that their choice the, the selection of the nation of Israel was not to salvation for Israel, it was to provide a savior for the whole world. And uh, he goes on to say that not all Israel are of Israel. There are those who were physically related to Abraham who are not part of that chosen number. And so obviously when he refers to those who are the chosen ones, he's explaining to us why God chose this very narrow path uh, through the nation of Israel, why he chose Isaac and not Ishmael, why he chose Jacob and not Esau. And we don't have to guess at the basis of his choice because he says why, and he says that the elder shall serve the younger. So he says it wasn't because of the children in their performance seemed to be a better choice, because the choice was made before they were born, before they'd done any good or evil. That's in verse 11. And the election then would stand not on works, but on the basis of him who calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now here it's not talking about individual people. Uh, the Lord had said there are two nations in your womb. And uh, the term Jew, of course, the description of the Jews, as opposed to all the other nations, the Gentiles, God specifically selected them and isolated them through various rituals and clothing and food laws. 
so that they couldn't mingle among the Gentiles with the objective of protecting the messianic line until the Savior could come. So this idea, the elder shall serve the younger, is going to be one of the motifs throughout the scripture. The idea being that in the spiritual sense, uh, it's through the second birth that I receive the blessings of God, not through the first birth. And the idea that the elder, that is what I am by my natural birth, should be a servant to what I am through my spiritual birth and not the other way around. So he, he then makes this statement, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. So the idea is that, that God was not playing favorites by selecting one over the other, but he was establishing the principle that the first one born who had a right by law would be bypassed to those who did not have a right by law who could simply claim God's grace and mercy. Now, it didn't mean then that the one born first could not get in on the blessing of God, but they would have to come through the door of mercy and not by demanding their rights. And uh, this was the great debate that the Lord Jesus was constantly having with the Jewish leaders who thought they had a place by right because they were Abraham's children. And the Lord Jesus made it clear to them that that was not the case. So uh, the objection that people might have is that it appears as if God has been unrighteous in selecting certain people over other people. But the purpose of that selection was to isolate a line of humanity through which the Savior of the world would come and then the salvation would be offered to everyone. And so when the statement is made immediately following this, he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. Uh, and I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion, um, he immediately introduces then the subject of Pharaoh. The issue now is, what happens if those agents whom God has chosen to accomplish his purposes resist his work in their lives? He's going to ultimately get to Israel and this issue that they blinded themselves, they rejected their Messiah, and the question is, if people fail, does God fail? And the answer, of course, is no. The actual fact is that Pharaoh ends up accomplishing God's purpose. And the idea that Pharaoh was hardened, God hardened Pharaoh in his own choice. So God has specifically explained to us in his word that his choice was for the ultimate objective of blessing the whole world. He chose Abraham, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So at the end of this section, he says, God has concluded all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. That's always been God's objective. And this is the glorious gospel. So you Romans and you believers today, don't be afraid that you're going to slip out of his hands, that he's going to turn away his love from you. The reason he set Israel aside was not because he stopped loving them. The reason he set them aside was that through that uh, blessing that had been given to Israel, it would then come to the Gentiles who would accomplish his purpose. And part of that purpose was to bring the blessing back to Israel. So if we can follow the line of reasoning, we worship with Paul and we say, who has been God's counselor? Where did he get these amazing ideas from? We worship him that he found a way to extend his mercy and grace to every creature. Yeah, it's great to see when talking about Pharaoh and how uh, he's not an object of wrath, but he's a vessel of wrath. Uh, so God is using him like a vessel uh, for his wrath. And like you said in chapter 11, the reason is to have mercy on all. And so when we look at the result of God's wrath in Egypt, we see uh, that when Joshua gets to Jericho, Rahab says, we remember what mm. your God did to Pharaoh. Right. And then hundreds of years later, when the Ark of the Covenant gets taken by the Philistines and God sends plagues on the Philistines, they say, we mm -hmm. remember mm -hmm. yeah. what happened to the Egyptians. So right. even all those years ago,
And uh, even uh, the culmination of the plagues uh, was the uh, was the Passover, mm-hmm. well, probably the greatest gospel message in the Old Testament. And so, uh, using Pharaoh as a vessel of wrath, God is able to extend his mercy uh, through that. Amen. Amen. Remember to like the video, leave comments, and we'll take those questions that people leave and make a Q&A exclusively on those questions. Make sure to share and subscribe uh, to keep in touch with all new and upcoming videos.